Hello, everyone. I'm Keith May from Historic England. And I think some of what I'm going to say is going to follow on quite well from what Jay was was talking about in terms of, sort of like reuse of data, because I am going to kind of explore some some efforts I went to to actually get into archives and reuse and some of the issues around re reuse of, of the digital data we have. So I'm as well as 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 myself, I'm presenting on behalf of a colleague, James Taylor at York University, and Kenneth Aitchison and Doug Rocks McQueen, if he's not here, they're both from working from from Landwood Research. And I, as it says there, I, I'm also a visiting professor at the University of South Wales, and I'm going to present work that was actually, although I work for Historic England, I'm presenting uh, work that was funded through Arts and Humanities Research Council, UKRI funding. So we're going to talk about this kind of data problem that the, that, that, that the previous speakers of all, the Mike and others, and Jay and Tom, we've talked about already, the lack, sort of a lack of interoperability and reuse in some of our digital project data, which you, know, you could say is making it unfair at the moment. And I kind of want to deal a bit around questions of, because I have primary data, the sort of data that was recorded through excavation, and, and distinguish that a bit around that, and secondary data, the data that comes through from post-excavation. So we're going to explore particularly sort of issues around post-excavation. This came out of work, some previous work I've done on, 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 on research projects looking at how to make data interoperable, interoperable through semantic technologies. Um, and the idea was to sort of like go out and look at, at post-ex post and what people were doing in their post-ex outputs and, and use that to map data together. So I'm going to talk about two projects, basically a, a project that was first funded called the Matrix Project, which was looking at stratigraphic data, trying to find where there were consistencies in how people did the analysis of in po post-ex and then looking at the reuse of stratigraphic data as, as, a, as a use case in particular. We thought stratigraphic data, primary data, very important to link our data together, as like Jay was in, indicating. And I'll talk a bit more about that. And the second project then came out of the first project because there were like, sort of outcomes from the first project which led to us need, we decided to go on to develop how we went to leading on to developing a, a, a kind of handbook about post-ex practice. And I'll talk a bit more about that and some of the recommendations and particularly how that might be useful in picking up on what was said in those who are in the plenary session uh, uh, earlier this morning about CPD, continuing professional development and how we might teach students and how we might bring this stuff to, together to be more useful in, in the data that we, we finally end up with in the archive. So the Matrix project really sort of like, I, was, I originally set out the project with the idea that I would go and talk to some of the major archaeological units in the country, understand what their processes were for post-excavation, and then be able to kind of map their process data from their data sets together to actually do cross-searching through that data. So we tried to ask people, like, so what, what are your post-ex procedures? Where's your manual for post-ex? And so many times people were able to offer me a recording manual for what went on in the field. And that makes sense. Yes, you go out in the field. You need to get your data consistent through what's being done in, on a project when you're in the, in, in the ground. But as the time went by, more and more it became clear that there weren't these, these post-excavation manuals that we were expecting to find that consistently kind of dealt with how data was recorded during post-excavation, so say. There were, there were examples of things where how you put data into a database. So, you know, if you've got an Oracle database, here are the fields you fill in. But it wasn't that kind of le at that level of conception of how you do grouping and phasing. So basically, we were sort of asking people as well around questions of, are you reusing data at all? Do you share data with other organizations? How do you share it within your own organization? And within the organizations, they would clearly have a database that they could work with. But when it came to sharing it across with other organizations, that's where some of the issues arose. So I kind of this diagram, I don't expect loads of detail, but what we kind of did by talking to the main archaeological organizations, it became clear that there were kind of like two, two different routes through the way that post-ex was done. And the kind of like, there's a kind of typical overview that people would go out, you do an excavation, then you might assess what you find, you do, the, you do then move through to analysis, you work through the analysis, get all the data together, publish and archive. And that's kind of what 
you see as I, uh, that original picture I had up of the river, there was this kind of sense that the archaeological work flowed through like that river, but there were two banks to the river. There was the kind of research-funded approach where if you got enough research funding for a, a, a big project, you would get, be able to get through to archive quite consistently. But from the, the, upper, the upper level in this, is meant to represent what kind of was we were finding through the commercial archaeological work. And I think Jay alluded to this a bit about well, why are you not finding this data in the ADS? Very little of the commercial data is currently being archived at all. I think Claire Sang, they said something like 2% of all the, the archaeological data in the UK has reached ADS so far. And there's various complicated reasons around that. And of course, I think a lot of people know, I mean, I take... I know personally that the OASIS system leads people to produce a report which is deposited with ADS, but whether the data actually, anything other than a PDF of the report gets there is another question. And that led on to some of these issues around trying to find stratigraphic data. Often all we would find was a PDF in the back of a, of a printed report, which meant the data was completely unreusable, you know, unless you were going to have to type it all back in. The real point here was like, yeah, there's lots of different steps in this process as well. So it's not just about archiving the excavation data, but it's archiving the analysis data. And we're looking here, I mean, the phrase I'm looking here about data management plan, because a lot of promotion around how we might track some of this data would be useful if we had data management plans that were actually practical. They are a good idea, but at the moment they're something of a tick box. And I would like to advocate that we make sure that we use data management plans and update them throughout the process so that what the data, because some of our data isn't there until you've done the analysis. A lot of the specialist finds data and the dating data and the phasing and how the different contexts were put together to say like these different postals are actually a building. That actual interpretation may not be there until later on in the process. So we need to kind of keep that up to date so that when the person comes along and wants to reuse that data at the start of the next excavation, if they're going to excavate the site next door, then they actually need that, that, that data to be there in a form that they can reuse. And I've, there's various ways that you can represent this. I use that idea of the, 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 the approach that, that Tara Nixon put up. But I also want to make the point that there is a kind of research cycle benefit to this, that our data, if we want to reuse it, we need to be actually thinking about how somebody else is going to use that data when they come along afterwards. Particularly if that person happens to be some a PhD student, who had a PhD student working with Caitlin Bucket Sheffield, who wanted to reuse data, the stratigraphic data for Bayesian chronological, chronological analysis or chronological modeling, and basically found, as I say, all, the best she could find was largely matrices in, in PDF format in the backs of books. And as you can see, out of something like 10,000 OASIS or 10,000 OASIS reports and, and, and metadata which she found on ADS, so that's 358, said they had stratigraphy. And even then, it was debatable whether she could actually reuse any of it. So this is not a, a tale of doom, but it's just a, a, a point that, that we need to try and get some of this data in a, in a standard that can, can be reused. Um, I'm going to quickly move through, move on, because time going by. And I just this diagram is really just to re-emphasize the importance of the stratigraphic data. I think it's kind of like critical in how, if you want to put data together from, from different sites, you need to understand how that data fits through the stratigraphy. I mean, not all sites will have complex stratigraphy. I appreciate that. But where, where there is complex stratigraphy, then we need to be able to actually use it in a sensible way. And I, I would tend to argue that the, the sites that most want to be synthesized will have that, that level of complexity. So some of the, you know, there are some good examples. As I think we've got T5 up there, high speed two, you know, Jay said that is a better example. And we are moving in the right direction. But I think, as I was saying here, the, 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 the point here is that this is Harris's view of how stratigraphy was recorded in, in when he wrote the principles of stratigraphy 89. But now we have these new technologies like GIS, structures of motion, not to mention Bayesian chronological modeling. And we actually need processes which actually reflect how that data is now being recorded as well using GIS. And that does influence how that stuff ends up in the archive. So there are questions around how we keep this kind of work sustainable into the future. We came up with a, a, a recently published something in antiquity with James Taylor. I and mean, we talked about different 
key variables that can affect how the data ends up in the archive. And I guess, you know, I'm not going to dwell on this, but funding sources doesn't make, I've emphasized that already, project management regimes, but key ones for us as archaeologists, beyond the, the, the actual archaeology and the scale of the site, are things like methodological choices, digital practice, and things that, that, that would influence that. So I'm going to get through as time is going through. Um, just this is a bit of a joke. That's Alex Bayliss doing chronological modeling at Chattel Hewitt. And then we don't really want to be lying on the floor with bits of paper. So one of the things we did in under matrix was develop a, a, a phaser tool here, which is, is an example. It wasn't, uh, I'm not here trying to sell software, but it's an example of how we might be able to better improve our stratified data to enable us to, in, the, I'm going to show in here is that we, we, sh we demonstrated that the data that came through from the stratigraphy could be combined using temporal modeling that take, took on the, the temporal differences between different, where, where the stratigraphy showed that the, 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 the data was above or below, the temporal modeling, if you took the, took the, the dating evidence alongside it, might reflect that there were actually inconsistencies in how that stratigraphy would be analyzed. I'm not saying this, this data set is an example which I did get from ADS, which is a good exemplar from the Crossrail site, from XSM10 site. And, it, and I actually seeded this. So where you're seeing the, the red examples here, it's not to say that they did it wrong. It's that just to demonstrate that the software could actually analyze it and, and allow the archaeologists to, 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 to distinguish where there were inconsistencies in the data. But you need the data in a good enough format to be able to do this. And the idea here was that people would be able to check this and work with it as they went through. So that, that was one output. Coming forward to where we are now, as I say, the second project is about producing a handbook. Now, the real outcome of this was we thought we would be able to go around to people and say, what is your process? How is your data being recorded? Let's try and signpost that in the archives in a way that would allow people to reuse it more effectively. In the end, we found out that those kind of handbooks don't exist, and this led to the idea that we would actually produce a guide to good practice that was about stratigraphic analysis. So here's a kind of reveal. I'm not going to try and show you the website in the time remaining, but that is that is a linked website. And we've been talking with CETA, started originally, got the, the funding with FAME to talk to, to various, the, the main bodies around FAME. We ran focus groups. We dealt with practicing archaeologists in the field who were familiar with post-ex analysis. We produced a series of different pages around, based around this kind of broad outline of topics. So we're kind of like looking, working through sort of how you check your stratigraphic data and the relationships, how you do grouping, how you do phasing, dating and periodization of, of data, land use, and how you derive stratigraphic analysis. And the main point of that was we also documented what were the main outputs that came from, from that kind of process, which has allowed us to produce some tables of what we say were the key outputs as part of this work. And one of those, that, that Excel sheet on the site is, just shows the data that I downloaded from ADS, and there's the actual raw CSV that came from XSM10, the Crossrail site, came into an Excel, put it into an Excel sheet, and I, like, I would advocate perhaps along with Jay, in terms of trying to produce these standardized outputs, if we could produce something that was like this sort of table of phasing and grouping consistently from each organization, that would make a huge step towards making our data interoperable. Just having, it doesn't mean you have to call your fields or change your database to say the same field names, everything. It's just having, having the sort of like the ability to understand the semantics behind what are in those fields and having those fields consistently gathered and captured and, and put into the archive, that would be the step that I would advocate. So do, you know, if you get a chance, I would go and have a look on, at, at the handbook and see more about what those outputs are. Another thing, I'll just make a, an opportunity while I'm here to, to advocate also, that one of the things that would allow us to do, what we found in, in our work was, I wanted to try and do some of this work on what, what Matt Edgeworth is talk, talking about in terms of the boundary A, the, the boundary at the bottom of, of the archaeology. What we found, there was no consistent standard even for where we stop. I think individual organizations may, you know, they may have a, a standard, they may consistently, like MOLA, have a, 
a, a consistent way of saying NFE, called no further excavation. They put a plus at the top. But that then we found that other organizations don't you know, you don't always know if there was no further excavation because they actually reached what we'd call natural or whether it was just stopped because the developer needed that. That was the depth they went to. So being able to actually say where the bottom of the archaeology is in itself would be a good thing. And that would, I think, allow us to make some of these sort of cross comparisons to join up data and, and make, make an advance in, in how we could integrate our stratigraphic data with other kind of environmental issues as well, make a, a advo advocacy for, for archaeological stratigraphy to be reused perhaps in, if by other, other domains as well. So finally, I'm going to wrap up and just say we need me here. I think there's a, the opportunity with this handbook is going back to what was said in the plenary, an opportunity for CDPD development for, for professional archaeologists in the field, because I would say understanding how post-excavation data is captured and used in post-excavation would, would enhance the record that people are recording in the field. I think it's a real opportunity to improve skills in the field if, if people had a kind of level of handbook for, the, for, their, for their CPD work, but also for students when they're in universities, that, that that would also be a chance. So the question I'm going to put to the audience is, anyone have any examples of this elsewhere in the UK? But even I've asked this question at the EAA and internationally, whether there are examples happening internationally abroad. And to sum up, so if I have time, we need, I'd say, to reduce the amount of data that we're just storing in archives without understanding how it's going to be reused by people. We need to make the data more practically reusable, like not just PDFs. I would argue, yes, we, I would argue potentially there's, we, you know, I've been talking about single context recording in a UK context, but there are people using stratigraphic data elsewhere globally. So an international convention on this for doing things like Boundary A would be really useful. And just another shout out for data management plans and the FAIR principles.